Psalm 37 again, and we're going to finish the second part. We did the first part, the first 20 verses of Psalm uh, 37. So if you want to be turning there, there it's uh, kind of like a long psalm. And so we had to break it up in a couple of places or a couple of two pieces. Um, I want to start off with the reality that, as we mentioned already earlier, 15 years ago today, Terrorists attacked uh, America, and about 3,000 souls lost their lives. And for a, for a time, we became very united, and we uh, got closer to God as a nation. And my understanding that is in New York, people became very friendly and united and called upon the Lord. And it was a, an awesome time. And since then, there's been continued fighting against terrorism. And we have, of course, great men and women in the military. Great men and women in the military. And we are very, very grateful. And we live in a nation that fights for freedom. And even when we disagree, whether it's religiously or even philosophically, we live in a nation that it's okay you know, we can disagree on these things, but we have freedom of conscience. And so we live in a great, great country. And we have a great, great military. But we have to be careful to move on from there and to say, what, where is our ultimate trust? We can trust these chairs we're sitting in. We can trust in the air conditioner working right. <laughs> We can trust in many things, and it's good to think in that way, right? Uh, but we need to ask the question of ultimate thoughts, because really that's what matters. When we stop breathing, what's going to happen? It won't matter if we have a trillion dollars. It won't matter if we have 10 PhDs. It won't matter much of anything. What will matter is our relationship with God. And how we lived this life. Whether we lived for his kingdom or we lived for ourselves. And so it becomes very, very important. And then we say, um, what are we thinking about our future? Some of us don't even think about our future. We just think about today. At this moment. And that's a very, very dangerous, sad way to live. Because then life happens and like, oh, what happened? I, well, what decisions have you been making? You see, decisions we make now will affect the future. And some of those decisions will affect even into eternity. And most of the time, we don't hear about that. We just hear about you can get it now. You can get that new thing now. Just use plastic. You know what? We'll even give you a couple of hundred dollars back cash. <laughs> Oh, my goodness, they know how to get us, right? You can get it now. But when trouble comes, what do we turn to? I mean, massive troubles. Whether they're floods or earthquakes or cancer or what have you. Where do we turn to? Where are we depending upon? Who are we turning our next generation to? Our next generation is, is facing many, many things that are awful. I mean, 9-11 happened 15 years ago. And I dare say, we're a lot less safe these days. And our young people are facing such future. Where are we turning them to? Who are we turning them to with confidence? Uh, our candidates for president? Our national abilities? Who are we turning our next generation to? In 1 Corinthians, 15, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul, by way of introduction, the Apostle Paul is, talk, is writing to the Corinthians who had a bunch of problems. The church had a bunch, a bunch of problems. And uh, the Apostle Paul was laying the foundation as he was going to be addressing all these kinds of problems uh, 
in the Corinthian church. And I just want you to look at uh, some verses here before we go into Psalm 37. Uh, 1, Corinthians 5, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 18. For the word of the cross, the gospel, the things about Jesus Christ, right? for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. And that's the key. To come to know God. That's the key. So let me start verse 21 again. For since the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom does not come to know God, but God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. So we ask the question, what are you, what are you and I mostly concerned about? What are we mostly concerned about? How many times do you and I wholeheartedly turn to God and cry to God and then rest upon his almighty power and all wise plan? How many times do we do that? Because if we do not, it shows who we're turning to, right? If we don't turn to God in crying and resting upon him, then we're turning to someone else or something else. So it's a very, very important question. Because you see, who we turn to then this, uh, determines, determines the decisions that we make on a daily basis. It determines what decisions we make. And sometimes those decisions are going to affect us right now, a week from now, a year from now, 20, 30, 40, 50 years into eternity. The decisions we make now. And so it's very important to ask the question, who are we turning to? Are we turning to God Almighty or not? Psalm 37 addresses that ongoing question for believers. And that is this. Why? Why do the ungodly seem to be getting away with it? And those that want to follow God, pow, every time you try to do anything wrong, it's like, oh, this sounds so unfair. It's so unfair. It seems that way. And so Psalm 37 is about that. And there is a call to trust the Lord. It's a call to trust the Lord. The first time we went through Psalm 37, we covered the first 20 uh, verses. And we talked about the results of not trusting God. And so if you want to hear that whole message, go back on the website and, and look at it. Uh, and the end of what happens when we don't trust God is verse 20, right? That was the punchline. Uh, but the wicked will perish. And the enemies of the Lord will be like the glory of the pastors. They vanish like smoke. They vanish away. You decide not to trust the Lord. You decide to be hardened. You decide to be self-sufficient. You're going to end up in a life of meaninglessness. Your whole life will be nothing. A big, massive waste. All your efforts and everything vanish. That's what happens. But now we're going to cover what happens, you know, when you do trust the Lord. And, and what kind of a person will you be? In spite of the fact that the wicked seem to be getting away with it. You see? And so 
I summarize, wisdom, wisdom, and by the way, the whole uh, Psalm 37 is wisdom literature. It's kind of like Proverbs. As you read this Psalm, it's like, just like reading Proverbs. And so that's what we're going to see here. So wisdom, wisdom calls to trust the Lord for all time, else suffer permanent loss. It's a, a sad thing when I have worked and worked and worked and worked on the weed eater at home and hours and then it still doesn't work. It's like two or three hours working on this crazy thing and it's such a huge waste. Well, imagine 10, 20, 30 years at working in life and then it doesn't work. Oh, my. Jesus calls it, and it'll be a great fall. Because they built their house on the sand rather than on the rock, the word of God. And so here in the psalm, it's called, man, follow the Lord. Don't be comparing to the world. You follow the Lord. That's wisdom calling or you're going to suffer permanent loss, you see? And so Psalm 37, I break it down this way, verses 21 to 26, the characteristic of the righteous, he blesses. The person that follows God blesses others. Verse 27 through 33, what are the foundations of the righteous? What are the foundations of the righteous? Verse 34, 38, call to live for the Lord. There's a call to live for the Lord. And then verse 39 through 40, the final call to turn to the Lord. Okay? So then, first of all, let me, before I go on, I said this is the last time of, verse, of chapter Psalm 37, that Psalm 37 is written in the Old Testament, and that means that there wasn't all the revelation that was going to be revealed. So as you read the Psalm, you want to be aware that you know, Jesus hadn't come yet. God hadn't revealed all the plan about the future and, and rewards and heaven and so forth. So just be aware of that as we read this psalm. And as Christians, we can look back and be even more encouraged than the psalmist because we have more revelation in the New Testament. So just be aware of that. Let me read the passage. As we've said, we've already covered the first 20 verses. And so let me start in verse 21 of Psalm 37. The wicked borrows and does not pay back, but the righteous is gracious and gives. For those who bless, uh, blessed by him will inherit the land, but those cursed by him will be cut off. The steps of the man, and really the translation should start off with uh, from the Lord. So it says the steps of the man are established by the Lord. It should be from the Lord, the steps of the man are established. And he delights in his way. When he falls, he will not be hurled headlong, because the Lord is the one who holds his hand. I have been young, and now I am old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, or his descendants begging bread. All day long he is gracious and lends, and his descendants are a blessing. Depart from evil and do good, so you will abide forever. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his godly ones. They are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked will be cut off. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom, and his tongue speaks justice. For the law of the Lord is in his heart, and his steps do not slip. The wicked spies upon the righteous and seeks to kill him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand or let him be condemned when he is judged. Wait for the Lord and keep his way. And he will exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you will see it. I have seen a wicked man, violent man, spreading himself like a luxuriant tree in his native soil. Then he passed away and lo, he was no more. I sought for him, but he could not be found. Mark the blameless man, and behold the upright. For the man of peace 
will have a posterity and really shalom. It should be, should be peace there. But transgressors will be altogether destroyed. The posterity of the wicked will be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is his strength in time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. So first of all then, the blameless or the righteous bless others. And so in this section, there's a contrast that's being made. The contrast between the characteristics of the wicked and the characteristics of the righteous. And this is what happens. The wicked take and take and take. They are needy. The righteous are gracious and they give and they give and they give. Why? Because they are secure. Because they know God and they're being nourished by God. So they're able to give in their life rather than just take, take, take. And that's what he starts off with in verse 21, right? The wicked borrows and does not pay back. And in the, in the Old Testament, borrowing is very different than what we think about in our modern times. In our modern times, we think what? Oh, I need a car. I need a new car. I need a new house. You know, let me go borrow from the bank. And there's nothing wrong with that. But in the Old Testament, the understanding was different. When somebody had to borrow, there was an indication they were not being blessed by God. They were needy. So in Deuteronomy, those that are cursed have to borrow. And that's the indication here. He borrows already indicating that he's not walking right. It's not about just modern times about, you know, I'm going to buy something. And it's not that I'm needy, 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 but I like to have this. And no, 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 no. Back then it's like already showing where they were. But then they borrow and they're not even, they're not willing to pay back. They're just takers. Uh, but the righteous is gracious and gives. The righteous experiences the grace of God. He experiences the gifts of God. And then he has to give to others. You see? And so many people today are so empty. So empty. They've got nothing to give. So sometimes when people get together, they talk, 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 talk. And they give nobody else a chance to talk because they got to, <laughs> I got to get something for somebody. You know, be quiet, man. <laughs> be quiet and receive and give. No, everybody's so desperate, so desperate. Talking, talking, talking. Nobody's communicating. And it's real sad. Empty, 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 empty. But those that are righteous, and by the way, uh, let me stop here on the righteous. I've said this before. The righteous are not those that are sinless, that they commit no sin. No. The righteous are not necessarily those that never go through troubles. No. The righteous can go through a big troubles. The righteous can sin greatly. So what's the difference between the righteous and the wicked? Here's the main difference. The righteous turn to God all the time. In bad times, in good times, at all times, the righteous turns to God. So they sin greatly. They don't hide, rationalize, make excuses. No, God. Here's the truth. Here's the truth, God. That's the righteous person. You see? In their joys, they just don't like, oh, I'm having a great time. I, well, man, how'd you get that? I'm my hard work. I did it. And God, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to thank him. <laughs> no. The righteous in everything. Look at God. They turn their shame to God. Their failures to God. Their joys to God. That's the righteous person. And so the righteous, they turn to God and they receive from God. And they're able to give and give and give. They're gracious. And why? 
For you see, the blessed by him, by God, will inherit the land. But those who cursed by him will be cut off. This is straight out of Deuteronomy 28. If ever you have a chance, read Deuteronomy 28. Blessings, 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 blessings. The first part of the chapter, the second part of the chapter, cursing, cursing, cursing. Those who follow the Lord. And that's why the, the righteous are able to give. You see. And they give and give because God is with them. Verse 23 just as a, that's why it's very important in the Hebrew, from the Lord is at the very beginning of the verse. And that's why I want to emphasize and kind of correct the trans or where the things are here. From the Lord. The steps of the man are established. Um, because it's so tempting to turn to ourselves, right? It's so easy. And the word there for man is not the usual Adam or Ish. It's a Geber. This is a, a, the word of a, of a man at his best. The man of strength. The man of character. The man, a godly man. That's the word that is used there. From the Lord. Not himself. Not technology. From the Lord, the steps, the way he behaves, the way he carries his life, the man or woman that carries her life in according to God's will, that is a beautiful woman. That is a godly, strong man. His steps are established. They are sound. They walk right. You see? And that's what he's talking about here. From the Lord, the way a man lives, a woman lives, their lifestyle is well established, is sound. And he delights in his way. That is this sound man, this strong woman, this beautiful woman, delights in doing God's will, God's way. And sometimes we're far, far from it. Why? Because we don't spend that much time with the Lord. Because we really don't obey. And we're talking about just me right here. Me, me, me. And we don't think about the things of God. But this person is well established. That doesn't mean that he never falls. That doesn't mean that he doesn't have hard times. The very next verse. The, psalm, the Psalms are so realistic. So awesome. Because they speak about truth. And so here the psalmist is looking, not that he doesn't fall. Sometimes he does. Verse 24. When he falls, he will not be hurled headlong. In other words, it's not going to be fatal. It's not going to be the end. It's not going to be destruction so bad. No. Why? Why? Because the Lord is the one who holds his hand. Isn't that great? It's okay when I fall, in other words. But as long as I'm turning to the Lord, He's going to keep me. It's going to be okay. Isn't that great? Ah, oh, praise God, because it's not a matter of, i got to get it right all the time. i got to get it right all the time. Oh, man, am I doing it right? Ooh. No. It's okay to fall. Not that I'm intentionally going to fall, but I don't have to be worrying because God is with me. You see? It's that ongoing relationship with God. And so when he falls, he's not headlong. He's not deadly. Because the Lord is with him. And then he gives his own experience. I have seen. I was young. And now I am old. I say, amen. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken. Or his descendants begging bread. I've lived long enough to see. Those that have walked with God for years and years. And I've seen them fall, like I've seen myself. But God is faithful. God is faithful. God is faithful to provide for him and his descendants. They will not be begging. Wow. And that's what the psalmist is saying here. It's not that we're going to have the latest and best and so much, so much. No, but what we need, we can relax. We won't be begging for bread. All day long, and he repeats now, 
the characteristic of the righteous. Look at this. All day long. This is their characteristic. It's not like when they feel good, when they have a liver quiver, and oh, I feel good, so I'll, I'll give to you. <laughs> no. All day long. This is their characteristic. All day long, he is gracious and lends, and his descendants are a blessing. Wow. Those who are related to that person, to that woman, to that man that's walking with God. They're going to have strength to give to others. Oh, it's so wonderful to see uh, someone like that. And I am especially, especially moved and impressed when I see a young person be that way. When a young person is, gives and they're just... We're ready. They're, it's not like, oh, they're like idiotic and just, okay, let me give everything away, you know, and, and no wisdom. No, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. But there's something there that they're ready to give, even if it's just a little conversation, but they're willing to give. It's so awesome. And when a person, an adult, is doing that way, it's like, wow, I want to be around that person, right? And it's just uh, great to experience, and that's the righteous person, the one who's walking with God. Now, how do, we, how do we get there? How are we going to experience that, to, to have that type of a lifestyle? I, I like to have that lifestyle, to be able to give and give and, you know, be gracious and so forth. Well, now, here are the foundations. What's next are the foundations of the righteous. And so here it is. We begin in verse 27. Depart from evil and do good. Depart from evil and do good. Now, the word, therefore, depart means to turn away. So we're walking along life, and we get to something, and we know it's not right. That website is not right. That type of environment is not right. That person I'm relating to day in and day out, they're not right. So that person walks to that situation and turns away. Nope, turns away, departs. Depart from evil. Now, that's taking something out of the bag, right? Don't have that situation in your life. Take it out of your bag. Take it out of your situation. Uh, but it's dangerous when we take out something bad out of the bag and we don't put anything back in there. Very dangerous. You know why? Because when we take something out of our lives, that's kind of fun. That's kind of mm, nourishing in a way, but it's a sick way. Maybe it's pornography. Maybe it's something that's not right. And it's kind of, it's ugly and it's deceptive, but it kind of excites us. And we take it away. What happens? There's going to be an emptiness in there. There's going to be an emptiness in there. And we may become more and more desperate. And so the temptation for that thing, that ugly, deceptive, corruptive thing to come back is very powerful. So, the first thing is to turn away from evil. Take it out of there. But the second part is what? Do good. You see that? Put something good into the bag. Start talking about the Lord. Start reading about the Lord. Start being honest with the Lord. Start talking to someone else about what you're struggling with. And you want the things of God. You start building good, solid, nourishing relationships. You see? Don't just leave it empty. Depart from evil and do good. And what's going to be the result? Second part of verse 27. And you will abide forever. And there's going to be this ongoing effect. It's going to be good, you see. That's why. Um, and why should we do that? Why should we turn away from evil and do good? Because quite frankly, many times evil is fun. F uh, evil feels like a lot of fun. Right? Don't look at me that way. You know it's the truth. <laughs> like, evil is fun. So why should we? <laughs> why should we turn away from evil and do good? You know why? Because then we'll be, be acting according to God's character. That's why. 
It's not so much that, oh, life is going to go better for me. That too is there. But the main reason, the main reason is that this is God's character. Look at the next verse. Verse 28. You see that word F-O-R? For is kind of like an explanation of why is it that I should turn away from evil and do good. For you see the Lord loves justice. Does Does not forsake his godly ones. They are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked will be cut off. God's character is a righteous character, and he's going to do what is righteous. That's why we're going to be reflecting him. And that's the greatest thing that you and I can do. That's the greatest thing that you and I can do is reflect God. We can invent Something great that nobody else has has discovered. Or we can create something that nobody else has created. It doesn't even come close to reflecting God. Living for him. That's the greatest thing. And you see, he says, well, this is God. God loves justice. And he's going to do what's righteous. That's why it's worth it to get away from evil as fun as it may be and do good, do what's morally right. And then he says, the fact is that the righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. The, uh, by the way, the inheriting the land, uh, it, it's repeated several times in this psalm. And like I said, they, they, they didn't have the full revelation as we have now. But the point is this. They're going to uh, receive, inherit the land. Now, to inherit something means that somebody gives it to you. And normally, it's the parents pass away, and there's an inheritance for the children, and they get an inheritance. Now, note, and I, I'm, it's real sad, but I've seen this happen a lot. Uh, the parents pass away, and uh, then there's fighting with the children as to who's going to get what. And it's real sad. But you know what's even more sad? When the parents make a will and they leave one of the children out. Oh! At that point, it's no longer a matter about the things. It's a matter of I am rejected as a person. And here, The sense of the psalmist is the wicked are not going to inherit anything. The righteous are going to inherit. The whole earth belongs to the Lord. And the land, the land of Israel, a special land given to the Jews. Those living according to covenant. And the sense here is you don't live according to the covenant. You're going to be left out of the inheritance. And it's no longer even about the land. It's that you are being rejected. Wow. And that's why the psalmist is saying, man, turn away from evil and do what is good. Because inheritance time is coming. Now, the foundation of the righteous... He lives to the Lord. And when he speaks, he speaks righteousness and wisdom. That's the, that's the characteristic, you see. And you say, Reuben, I'll, I'll never get there. Listen, baby steps, baby steps, one step at a time that you, you, you grow with God. One time. little step. Because look at the, 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 the next verse, verse 30. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom and his tongue speaks justice this is just their characteristic they just speak what is good wisdom and why is that because oh they remembered oh yeah i remember that lesson what better what can i say no you know why because it is deep deep in their heart that's why It's not that they have to memorize all kinds of stuff to make sure I say the right thing. No, it's in their heart. Look at the next verse. 
um, verse 31. The law of God is in his heart. And his steps do not slip. It, it's within them. It's within them. So why, right away it's telling us. It, it's a matter of being uh, uh, in that mode, in studying the word of God, in talking to others about the things of God. This is a lifestyle. This is a not once a week thing. And that doesn't mean that you let everything else go and just read the Bible 24-7. That doesn't mean that. But it means that you're conscious, that you're looking forward to, that you ask questions, that you decide to spend time in Bible study or talking to someone because you want to learn. And over time, it'll become in your heart. I remember when I first became a believer. And uh, I didn't know the books of the Bible. And they would, so they would say, turn to this. And, how do you get there? Like, okay, look at the table of contents, right? So I go by the table of contents, and by the time I found it, they were in like three chapters later. <laughs> so then I got tabs, right? I bought tabs, and I have every book. And so my Bible was full of tabs. And that was a terrible mistake, because the more I used it, you know, your fingers, I tore it. And I tore another one. It's like, <laughs> so frustrating. And yet over time, over time, you begin to know the scriptures, you see? And it becomes to be a part in your heart. It's not a religious pressure. Do you know the books of the Bible? And then we get all scared. It's not about that. It's not about that. It's about, you know, do we know the word? It's in their heart, it says. You see? It's in their heart. And you know what? It says there they speak, right? Verse 30. Look at it carefully. The mouth of the righteous utters. Wisdom. By the way, I think there's a progression. The Hebrew there for utters is like, mm, um, mm, uh, there's a, like a muttering, like that talking to themselves, like trying to figure out. And then there's a progression now, and his tongue speaks justice. So it's like this, the, wisdom, the guy of wisdom he spends time thinking, kind of muttering, to him, trying to figure it out. And finally, he gains wisdom, and finally he speaks. But when he speaks, he speaks justice, what is right. And do you think those around him are going to like it? Nope. They're not going to like it. In fact, in fact, they're going to attack. Look at the next verse. The wicked spies upon the righteous and seeks to kill him. Wow. Most of us don't face that, literally. Literally. Most of us are not wondering where somebody has a 45 and might shoot me because I shared the gospel. Praise the Lord for that. We live in such country. In other countries, you share the Bible, you share the word, your head may come off. But here, it's not like that. In the United States, praise the Lord. But, but, there can still be persecution, right? There can still be scorn and jokes about you if you walk with God and you speak about the things of God. And, and here, the wicked, like how spy, they spy on them. How can I trip them up? Uh, what are they going to say so I can make fun of them? Anything, ah, I make a joke of them. And that's the wicked. Because the wicked don't like it when we speak about the things of God. But in all that, the Lord says, not to worry, I'm with you. Not to worry, I'm with you, verse 33. The Lord will not leave him in his hand. Or let him be condemned when he is judged. I know my children fall, God says. But when judgment comes, I'm going to be with him. Going to be okay. Not so with the wicked. Not so with the wicked. In the final judgment, when we trust God, it's going to be okay. Not so with the wicked. And so, now, uh, that's really the, the great security, right? That we're going to be okay with God. But now, we say, okay, then let's commit to the things of God. There's a call to live for the Lord. And we start off in verse 34. Wait for the Lord and keep his way. Now, to wait for the Lord, as I've said before, doesn't mean, okay, Lord, do what is after. I'm just waiting on you. No, it doesn't mean that. To wait upon the Lord means that you eagerly expect his actions. 
You eagerly expect that he's going to fulfill his word. And in that great expectation or during that expectation, you keep doing what is right. You just don't sit there doing nothing. You keep doing what is right, meaning you still act morally, you still talk about God, you still do things what is right, what is responsible, what is responsible. If we are able to work, work. If you have duties of cleaning the dishes and throwing out the trash, clean the dishes and throw out the trash, man. <laughs> Be responsible. But keep expecting that God is going to take action. Wait upon the Lord and, what did it say? There it is. And keep his way. You see that? You keep taking action and doing what is right. And he will exalt you to inherit the land. There it is again. You're going to have an inheritance. When the wicked are cut off, you will see it. You're going to see justice come. Right now, they might have the upper hand because they have money, because they have power, because they have the position. But listen, the day is coming. You're going to see it. You're going to see it. And now he gives this, uh, again, the reality of the ungodly getting ahead, right? So he says, I have seen the wicked, uh, violent man spread himself like a luxurious uh, tree in his native soil. I've seen them, man, they get rich and rich and rich and, and they don't care anything about God and they just seem like, and they flaunt it. The word there for luxurious is like they throw themselves and look what I have and they flaunt it. Then he passed away, and lo, he was no more. I sought for him, but he could not be found. Now the righteous die too. What's the point? The point is this, that when the wicked die, they have nothing lasting. There is no memory of anything good that they did. People don't even remember him other than they gave me money, but nothing of significance. A meaningless life, even though they might have been super rich, meaningless, can't be found. And now he says, but you mark, you watch, you respect the next verse, verse 37. Mark the blameless. The word there is for keep watch and respect. Mark that person. And behold the upright. Observe carefully the upright. For the man, he be a man of peace. And he will have a posterity. He, the word there is going to have a future. And the future there is a life of meaning. It was God. He, he's going to be remembered for what he's done for eternity. Listen to this. You help someone with the gospel. You help someone with the things of God. Forever and ever and ever, they're going to say, listen, because you could have been watching a certain movie or game, but instead, you paid attention to me. And for all eternity, they're going to remember that. They're going to remember that that you gave to them. I remember the pastor, I became a believer, Ben Bravanek. And I pray, Ben, that you will see this. I remember when I first became a believer. I had a thousand million questions. And uh, one Sunday, I invited him for dinner. And his eyes got bigger. And I thought, uh-oh, is there something wrong? But then he said, yeah, sure. So I had him over for dinner, for, for lunch, right after church. And it was several years later that I found out that day was the Super Bowl Sunday. And his favorite team was playing in the Super Bowl. He gave the Super Bowl to be with me for all eternity. For all eternity. I'm going to appreciate that. Yeah. Never will forget. You and I can give to people, can give. Mark that man, it says. Observe that person. They have a great future. They have a great future. And you and I can have such a future if we give ourselves to God and walk with him, 
regardless of what everybody else is doing or not doing. Some people say, oh, if you only knew my parents. Oh, if you only knew my spouse. And on and on and on. And God says, don't look at them. Look at me. I'm your salvation. In fact, the last two verses is about that. Well, verse 38, the transgressors, and the word there in the Hebrew is those that rebel, the transgressors, those that say, no, God, I'm not going to follow you. Okay, the transgressor will be altogether destroyed. The posterity of the wicked will be cut off. But then he channels the, the psalmist goes back to the source, back to the source. And what is the source? Verse 39, but the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. Not themselves, not their own ingenuity, not their rational abilities, not their physical abilities, not their money, not their whatever. It's from the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble. When there's trouble, what does the righteous do? They run to God. When they're happy, what does the righteous do? They run to God. When they have sinned, what does the righteous do? They run to God. In time of trouble, they turn to God, who is their strength. The Lord, there it is again. That, come on, it's the Lord. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. They take refuge in him. And by way of contrast, many times it helps. To him in contrast to the world. To him, in contrast to a boyfriend. To him, in contrast to a spouse. To him, in contrast to self. Many of us turn to self for salvation and strength and, and everything else. No, no. It's from the Lord. It's from the Lord. That's the last point. Turn to the Lord. First application, as if there was enough application already. Well, well verse 21, uh, the characteristic of a righteous person, he gives and gives and gives, right? We need to become people that we give, not take. Some of us take, 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 take. Don't give him much back. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. We have to receive some things, right? In fact, some of the most fundamental things, salvation, we have to first receive, right? And if we don't receive from anybody, we don't have any fellowship, right? If we never receive from anybody, we go visit somebody, no, I'm not going to eat your food, I'm going to be dependent on you. Thank you very much. What? We need to receive from one another so we can have fellowship. But the main characteristic is that we need to be giving. Giving, not takers, you see? And you might say, Ruben, but I don't have anything. That's a great start. To be honest, that's the great start. You see? The honest, I feel empty, Reuben. I, I'm, I'm lost. Then what do you need to do? Turn to God. Turn to God. You see? Be honest. And Lord, this is where I am. I don't have anything. And that's the beginning to go, to get to the point that you can give and give and give to your spouse, even if your spouse is not giving back. You give to your children, even if your children are not giving back. You give to your parents, even though your parents may not have given it back. You give to your friends, even though your friends may not be giving you back. You give and you give. Because you're connected to the source of life, God himself. So we need to turn, be turning to people that are givers. Give. Um, verse 34 uh, says what? Wait for the Lord and keep his way. We must keep obeying as we eagerly wait on the Lord to take action. We must continue to obey God and give and uh, keep his way. Right? But we must eagerly be waiting for him. For him. Whether it's in this lifetime, in the next week, the next month, 
the next year. Okay, Lord, how are you going to work this out? How are you going to get my spouse to, to, to grow? How are you going to get my friends to, to see what I'm talking about? How are you? I, I'm waiting on you, Lord. In the meantime, I'm going to keep doing my part to do what is right. I'm going to stay faithful at church. I'm going to stay faithful at being honest with you. I'm going to stay faithful at reading about you. I'm going to stay faithful in praying, God. I'm going to stay faithful in doing what is right. While I hurt, while I allow myself to hurt because life is not working the way it's supposed to, I'm going to keep doing what is right. Keep obeying as we eagerly wait on the Lord to take action. And then finally, as if kind of... I don't know, maybe it sounds repetitious, but we need to keep turning to the Lord, right? We need to keep turning to the Lord every day. When, when you wake up, it's like, am I thinking about God? Well, maybe not. I'm already thinking about the pressures at work. I'm already thinking about, God, help me. God, help me. All these problems, God, help me turn to you. Lord, I want to serve you. I still have to do my job. I have to still have to be responsible. In fact, I need to do a very good job at my job. I wasn't hired to talk about God. I was hired to do a job. Let me do a good job. But in the midst of that of doing my job, Lord, remind me about you. Remind me of how I am to live in a godly, moral, ethical way. And help me, God. So in the morning, an hour later, 10 minutes later, 30 minutes at noon, mid-afternoon. God, help me. I want to turn to you in every which way. I failed. I, I, I did what was wrong. God, here's the truth. Turn to him. Turn to him. Turn to him. That's the point of this psalm. In all of life, in all of life, in all of life, wisdom calls us to trust the Lord at all times. And if we do not, we will suffer permanent loss. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, that you watch over us and you give us everything we need. Thank you for this body of believers, Lord, that they are here to worship you and to sing to you and to receive your word. Bless them, Father. Bless them. And if there's someone here who's never trusted in Jesus as their personal Savior, today, today, Father, right now, they will stop trusting in their own efforts, in tradition, or themselves, or stop trusting in all those and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Be with us, Father, as we continue our desire and efforts to worship you. Be with us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let my